Well, good evening, everybody. Why don't we pray? Father, we come before you right now in Jesus' name. And Father, I am so grateful for your great love. Thank you, sir, for the people that you healed in the last service here on a Wednesday night. Thank you, Lord, for, for your power that was made available on their behalf. I thank you for the people who, who've been coming back to you every Sunday in both services, Father. Those who are just getting born again, those who are coming back to Christ. We are so grateful. We're so grateful for your presence in our lives. Grateful for the ability to come together and worship you in freedom. Grateful for the ability to know you and to know your word. Father, we, we have such gratitude such gratitude in our hearts for everything that you've done. And I ask you tonight, Father, that you think through my mind, that you speak through my lips, that I might stand here and bring forth the word of God that you've placed in my heart for these people tonight. I thank you that you divide it severally to each one as you will, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. I thank you that I have a wide door of utterance. I thank you that you think through my mind, that you speak through my lips, and that everything that's in your heart for this service tonight is brought forth and brought to pass, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. I, I'm going to continue on. I don't need that. I think it's a praise and worship thing. I, I knocked it off when I started praying. I saw it, but... Oh, is it mine? Guess what? It's the last page of my sermon. <laughs> thanks, baby. I mean, thanks, Pastor Mark. <clears throat> <laughs> We're married, just for those of you who may not know. <clears throat> just want to make that straight. All right. <laughs> for a lot of really wonderful years. It's a good man. All right, we're uh, going to continue on with what we've been talking about uh, over the last couple months, really, probably now, and that's the signs of the last days. So let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Let's read our keynote scripture. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. How many of you know that's true? Yeah. For men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those who are good. Writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul began to give us signs that would tell us that we are in the last of the last days. Now, why is it important that we know that? Uh, number one, he didn't want us to be caught off guard. Number two, we'll know what season we're in. If you know what season you're in, you'll know what the appropriate behavior is for that season. We talked about a natural farmer, how in the spring, that's the season to till up and, uh, the ground and plant the seeds. In the summer, that's the season where you water and keep the critters out. And in the fall, that's the season that you harvest. And because you know what the season is, you know what you're supposed to be doing right? So he's telling us when we are in the last of the last days, so we'll know what season we're in, so we know what behavior is appropriate, all right? The third reason he told us is so that we can resist what's going on around us that's not from God. We've been talking about how there's an undercurrent in our society, a current like, like in a river or like in an ocean that's pushing us a certain way. And if it's pushing us in a way that, that is not uh, pleasing to God, then we, we need to be aware of it so that we know what's coming or what's here so we know what to resist. Are you with me? Uh, uh, that scripture that says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. One version says, do not let the world squeeze you into its mold. 
How many of you know there's a lot of pressure to be squeezed into the mold that everybody thinks is politically correct right now, socially acceptable? Uh, you know, there's just a lot of pressure right now. So I want us to look at these signs and you tell me if this is stuff going on now or stuff that's coming up. Because when you're on the highway and you see a sign, it usually either tells you what's coming, right? Three miles to McDonald's, right? <laughs> Or it tells you where you are. Welcome to Madison, Alabama. All right? Uh, and so uh, men, he said, in the last of the last days, men shall be lovers of their own selves. Do we see that now? Yeah. We do see it. They, they'll be covetous or greedy, want money. We see that now. They'll be boasters. Do you see that? They'll be proud. Is it now or is it coming? Yeah. Blasphemers. I've never seen such blasphemy as is going on in this day and age. Anyway, I'm not going to get off and I'll be re-preaching everything I've preached the last few weeks. We don't want to go there. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful. Unholy. Um, I've got unthankful in here twice, but truce breakers. Yes to all of them. But tonight I want us to look at the next one, which is false accusers. This is really interesting because the word that's translated false accuser, uh, there is diabolos. It's the same word that's used in places for the devil, who is the accuser of the brethren. That word actually means um, a traducer, especially Satan, a false accuser, a devil, a slanderer. I tell you, there is so much going on right now in our society about accusations. Well, you're narrow-minded. No, you're narrow-minded. Well, you're covering up. No, you're covering up. I am so tired of it. I can't even watch the news anymore. I have to turn it off. I have limited tolerance for bickering and nonsense. <coughs> and I have to be honest, they've just about exceeded it. There are so many people right now constantly accusing one another of all kinds of things. And a lot of it's not even true. A lot of it is false accusations. But I want us to look uh, in the book of Job tonight. And, and, and I don't want you to get real nervous that I said Job. Because a lot of people have dived into this book, started reading it, and drowned in about chapter three, never really understanding, you know, they get bogged down and they don't understand the theological complexity of this book. But let me boil it down for you. The book of Job is basically a theological discussion between four people who don't know what they're talking about. If you read the end of the book, God appears and talks to Job, and Job said of himself, I had heard a few things about you, and I thought I knew, but I was obviously wrong, and so I put my hand over my mouth, and I repent in sackcloth and ashes. Long about chapter 32. You can go back there and look if you want. And God was so mad at his friends who were there to comfort him that Job had to pray and ask the Lord to forgive them because they didn't know what they were talking about either. So once you get past, you know, the first chapter or so, up until God appears on the scene, it's basically a theological discussion uh, between four people who don't know what they're talking about. You can't take everything they say in that book as truth, or you're going to be confused by midway through the third chapter, maybe sooner than that. Because they're saying a lot of stuff, and they ac the Bible accurately recorded what they said, but that doesn't make everything that they said truth. Are y'all with me? Now, before you pick up a Bible or something to throw at me, how many of you know there are a number of things, a number of even lies recorded in the Bible, and they're accurately recorded. They were truly spoken and truly spoken that way, but that doesn't make what the speaker said truth. The first being in the Garden of Eden. When Satan said to Adam and Eve, go ahead and eat that fruit. You'll surely not die. How many, how many of you know they bought the farm on that one? He, Satan truly said that. And it was truly recorded what he said. But that doesn't make what he said truth. Are, are you with me? 
So I think that's a lot of what's in the book of Job. It's a theological discussion between four people who don't know what they're talking about. They're trying to explain things they don't understand. Uh, and so they say a lot of things that they believe to be true, but really probably aren't true at all. Uh, are you with me? And if you, get to the, if you can manage to get to the end of the book, you'll see that. All right? The other thing I want you to know about the book of Job is Job did not have a covenant with God. He wasn't Jewish. He wasn't an Israelite. He had no covenant with God at all. So he wasn't uh, under the covenant of the, of the Old Testament. He had no covenant. He was just a good guy. He was a good guy who'd heard a few things about God and decided he was, to the best of his ability, going to serve this God that he'd heard about. But he had no covenant, and he had no firsthand knowledge of God. He just heard a few things. And because of that, he began to offer sacrifices and do things that he had heard that people with a covenant do. And because of it, it caught God's attention. God liked this guy, even though he had no covenant. We're going to see here in a few minutes, God bragged on him to the devil. And he didn't even have a covenant. But his heart was right. And because his heart was right, God really blessed him. So even though he was, in fact, blessed by God, he did not have a covenant of protection. Do you understand? So let's read. Let's, let's dive in here. We ready? It's okay. We're, we're going to step in now. I believe in God. We're not going to drown. Job 1.1. 1, 1. Now there was a man in the land of Uz... Uz is not a Jewish territory, whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. He was the greatest of all the men in that area of the world. Now, I went online, 7,000 sheep at approximately $150 each. In sheep alone, he had $1,050,000 worth of sheep in today's money. 3,000 camels. The average price of a camel is 5,000, and that's pretty conservative. 3,000 camels at $5,000 a piece is $15 million in camels in today's money. He had 500 sets of oxen, of yoked oxen. In order to be yoked together, there at least had to be two of them. So we'll just say there's 1,000 oxen. At $4,000 an ox, that's $4 million in oxen. 500 donkeys times $1,500 each is $750,000 in donkeys. He had $20,800,000 in animals alone. How much land do you think it took for him to graze all those animals and to keep all those animals? He probably had miles, not just acres. He had to have huge amounts of land, plus all the servants to take care of them, plus the money to feed all those animals, plus the money to feed his household and his servants and everybody. I tell you, if somebody ever says you're like poor old Job, you ought to raise both hands and thank God, glory to God. Woo! That means you're going to be the wealthiest person in this area of the world. I mean, you're going to be the, oh, crud, I can't think fast enough. Steve Jobs, who's the Gates guy, then you're going to be rich. You're going to be right up there with, with the best of them. Your name is going to be right at the top. The Bible says he had the most beautiful daughters in the land. I mean, Job was a blessed man because God loved his heart. He had such a good heart towards God. Somebody ever says you're like poor old Job, 
you ought to really rejoice because at the end, he got twice as much. He got double. Now, theologians disagree on how long his troubles lasted. Some say nine months. Some say maybe a couple years. But you know what? If you got 40 years blessed, nine months of hard time, and then another 120 years or however long they lived back then, 200 years, however long they lived, of being doubly blessed, how many of you know that's not a bad gig? <laughs> Job was a very blessed man. We should be lucky to be like poor old Job. He was blessed. Verse 4. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. How many of you know Job respected God? He feared God. He wanted to do what was right. And he, even to the extent that he was trying to make up for his children and make sure they did right. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Verse 8, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Now I know at this point some people get mad. And they say, What in the world was God thinking? Here poor Job was, trying to honor God, doing everything right to the best of his ability. Why in the world did God point out Job to Satan? But how many of you know that's not what happened at all? I have a marginal note that says, literally, have you set your heart upon my servant Job? God was watching Satan as he was patrolling the earth. And God noticed that, he had, that Satan had Job in his crosshairs. And he said, have you set your heart upon my servant Job to hurt him, to destroy him? Let's look at the Young's literal translation so you know I'm not making this up. Young's literal translation of Job 1.8, the literal translation from the original language. And Jehovah saith unto the adversary, Hast thou set thy heart against my servant Job? Because there is none like him in the land, a man perfect and upright, fearing God and turning aside from evil. God saw that Satan was tracking Job. This, this, this uncovenanted man, but someone God loved. And so he confronted Satan about it. And he said, have you set your heart to, against my servant Job? But I want you to hear how God bragged on Job. He is a man, perfect and upright, fearing God. And turning aside from evil. Now listen, Job had no covenant. He had no right for the protection of God. But Job's heart was so right towards God that God defended Job to the enemy. God bragged on Job to the devil. Listen, may we all live our life in such a way that God can brag on us even to Satan. Are you trying to destroy them? You're going to find out. They are upright in heart. They are my faithful and obedient servants in everything they do. Do you understand? God bragged on this guy who didn't even have a covenant. Job 1.8, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? 
that there is none, the King James says, there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the works of his hands, his, and his substance is increased in the land. Job was blessed by God because his heart was right. If you keep reading, you just got to love this guy's heart. He thought God attacked him when Satan did. He literally thought it was God who did that to him. And instead of being mad at God, he said, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. you you got to love that heart. Even though his head didn't understand who was behind the attack. you got to love the heart. I'm his. And I'm going to serve him. And I'm going to love him. And a few verses later, he said, though he slay me, yet I'll serve him. Oh, my goodness. Now, we know God doesn't kill anybody. But you got to love his heart. He was a good man who had a good heart towards God. Now, in this verse, uh, Job 111, jo uh, but Satan's talking. He said, but put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. What was, what was Job, or what was Satan doing? He was accusing Job to God. How many of you know that's part of his job? That's part of his modus operandi, his MO, it is that he accuses constantly people. He accuses them before God. Uh, and, and I think this is so interesting. We can see that God didn't stretch forth his hand against him, uh, but... Uh, I'll, I'll teach on Job one day, someday soon. I'll, I'll do a whole teaching on it. But, but somebody says, well, you know, uh, no, he didn't. But he said, read verse 12. Put, can you put verse 12 up there? Job 1, 12. I know I didn't put it in my notes, but you can do it. And the Lord said unto Satan, behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Well, see, God gave him over to Satan. God didn't give him over to Satan because he wasn't God's. He didn't give him over to anything because he didn't have him. He had his heart, but he, but he didn't have a covenant. Now our covenant is based on our heart, thank God. But back then it was only based on where you were born and to whom you were born to. God was acknowledging the fact that Job didn't have a covenant. He was acknowledging the fact that, behold, all that he has is in your power. He wasn't giving him. He was making a statement of truth. Ah, all that he has is in your hand, is in their power. I don't have time. My point is, accusing people to God is what Satan does. Revelation 12.10 in the King James. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. The Bible calls Satan the accuser of the brethren. And the Bible says that in these, the last of the last days, people will be accusers of the brethren just like Satan is. I don't know about you, but I don't want, to, I don't want his job. I don't want to be helping him. You know, there, there is so much of that already going on in our society. I don't know what is the matter with people. So if you have somebody who's acting like a, a spoiled, rotten kindergartner, showing out and having temper tantrums, you think being uglier and more unkind and more accusing is going to fix it? What is this? Who can go the lowest? So if you have somebody who's acting out and not acting appropriately, then let them make a fool of themselves and let everybody see them for who they are, but let's take the high road. We don't, we don't have to get down in the mud because other people are down in the mud. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't care which side of the political aisle you're on. There are numbskulls right now acting like idiots on both sides with both feet in their mouth. I don't want to act like any of them. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. I love it on, when people answer the altar call that Pastor Mark sometimes asks one of them their name. And he says, you know, in heaven, Jesus just turned to the Father and said, Father, Joe's coming home. I love that. He's not the accuser. He's the helper, the intercessor, the advocate, the one who, who champions our cause before God. Father, I died for them. My blood covered their sin. Let's welcome them home. My goodness, what a different perspective. Back to Job a second. I want you to notice what Satan's objective was. When Satan attacked Job, his objective was not to take Job out. His objective wasn't to kill Job. His objective was to make him turn on God. His objective was to make Job stand with his fist in the face of God and say, you're not fair. I tried to serve you. I tried to do what was right. And look what's happened. You're not fair. You said that you would always be here. You said that you would always deliver me out of all my trouble. And look, what was it? He's trying to get us to accuse God. What is he doing when he attacks you? Trying to get you to turn on God in the same way. My goodness, we see it so much in our world. We see it so much in our world. Satan points at God and blames him for so many things, hoping humanity will turn against God, and they do. I hate to be the first one to tell you if I am, but God is not in absolute control of everything that happens down here. Satan is the God of this world. Well, the will of God will be done. The will of God is not done every single day. I can give you a scripture that says it's the will of God that there be no fornication. But are people fornicating? <laughs> it's the will of God that none should perish. But are some going to be lost? Humanity and their decisions have so much to do with whether or not the will of God is done in the earth today. And yet if Satan can get us to blame God for all the bad things that happen in our world, then he's won. I had a minister, an ex-minister say to me one day, if I ran my business as poorly as God runs this world, I'd be out of business, and rightfully so. He didn't begin to comprehend that Satan in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 is, is now called the God of this world. He gets a little G, he doesn't get a big G, but he has authority here because Adam and Eve gave it to him. They were given authority and rulership over the earth, and I don't know, none of this is in my notes, but somebody needs to hear what I'm saying tonight. 
When they changed kingdoms, everything under their control went with them. Just like when I changed families, and, and I went from my, uh, the, the family that I had before I married Pastor Mark, and I came over into Pastor Mark's family, everything went with me that was mine. That means Pastor Mark, uh, you know, he got a house full of furniture that he hated. We gave most of it away, but it came with me. I have a house in Florida that used to be my house when, before I was married, and now it's a Garver house. Do you understand? Because it came with me. Now we own a home. Well, Pastor Rhonda, you ought not say that because if you ever get divorced, we ain't ever getting a divorce. I don't know why people come in planning their way out. That's another story for another day. <laughs> but everything under my control changed families with me. It was the same with Adam and Eve. And what was under their control? The whole earth. Satan has a legal right to be here now. But he does so many terrible things. It's he that steals, kills, and destroys, the Bible says. So he does all this, and then he turns and he blames God. I was reading a magazine on an airline because it was a long flight, and I was reading the airline magazine, a secular magazine. And it was about a famous female reporter and how she became a reporter. And uh, she was talking about how her elementary school was built at the bottom of a hill and that a mudslide came and buried her school. And, um, well, you know, a lot of the children were killed. A lot of the teachers were killed. She was one of the few that was rescued out. And, but she said something in that magazine article that just broke my heart and still does to this day. She said, the day the mudslide came down the hill is the day God died for me. Now, I want you to know this magazine article wasn't about her religious beliefs. It was, but it was such a defining moment in her life that she felt, you know, it necessary to tell it as part of her story of how she became who she was. But how many of you know, up at the top of that hill was Satan with his hands muddy, having just shoved all that earth down and killing all those people because we know it's Satan that steals, kills, and destroys. And then he says it was God. It was God. It had to be God, right? He's in control of everything down here. But is he? Listen, if he was in control of everything, how many of you know he'd make us straighten up? He'd make us do right and be right. He'd make people get born again instead of go headlong off into destruction. The will of God is not always done in the earth today. We have a tremendous amount to do with whether or not it gets done. So did the people in Job's time. You know, anyway, the devil, the point of a lot of that he does is to get us to blame God, is what I'm saying, to accuse God. Why did you let that happen? How many of you know that? It's not our God. There are legalities. Anyway, I don't have time. Bible Institute, third quarter, redemption, be there. Are people false accusers in our day? Violently, virulently, foaming at the mouth right now. They are false accusers. Number 12, they're incontinent. From the Greek word ak akrates, it means powerless, i.e., without self 
control. Do people in our day lack self-control? They do. Well, I, I, I just couldn't help it. You know, I, I, just, I just met this cute little chick and, you know, the next, the next thing I know, I, I was waking up next to her. I, I, I don't know what happened. I, I just couldn't help it. Or, you know, I, I didn't mean to, to hit my wife or to abuse my child. I just, you know, I, I just, I just, something happened and I just, I just, I just snapped. I, I couldn't help it. Philip, stand up. Can you stand up? I want you to flex a little bit. Show, show everybody. How many of you know? That same guy who just slapped around his 100-pound wife, I could probably put him in the same room with Philip, and, and all of a sudden he might find some self-control. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? People do what they think. You can sit down now. Thank you. People do what they think they can get away with. I was flipping the other night trying to settle down after a long day, and I, I flipped, uh, you know, that channel that 600-pound uh, story, whatever that is, you know. And this woman was crying, and she was telling the doctor, you know, I can't help it. I just can't control it. I just, uh, she, but she's the only one who lifts her fork to her mouth. Do you understand what I'm saying? She could help it. And I have to say that the guy who was bringing her the food, because she couldn't even get up anymore. He could, and I'm not mocking. I'm not making fun. I understand people have troubles and people eat for all kinds of emotional reasons. You know, I, I totally understand that there are people who, who have issues in all kinds of different areas with drugs or alcohol or food. And I'm not mocking and I'm not making fun of them one little bit. But to say they absolutely cannot do anything about it, it's not true. They can go get counseling. They can deal with whatever it is that's causing them to act out in that way. Do you understand? Sometimes there's medicine that'll help people, especially not born again people. But once you're born again, you cannot legitimately say the devil made me do anything. I couldn't help it. I, I just, I couldn't help it. Yes, you can. Once you're born again, you're no longer just an unreasoning animal without the power of self-control. Jesus died so that you could have self-control and the power to do right. Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. Back in the day, and I know I'm dating myself, uh, but how many of you know you can't really say that once you're born again? Now, don't misunderstand me. The devil's going to come, and he's going to try. And he's going to push, and he's going to tempt, and he's going to draw, and he's going to shove, and he's going to manipulate, and he's going to whine. How many ever had your flesh whine? But I want it. The other night, I whined all the way to the gym. I don't want to go. <laughs> I am not kidding. Every single lap, all three and a half miles, my flesh was barking like a dog. I, every lap I had to say, we are not stopping. We are walking. Do you hear me? We are walking. <laughs> I got home and I told Pastor Mark, I said, you'll never know how much flesh that just cost me, but I did it. Anytime my flesh doesn't feel like doing anything, I, I think I even said it that night, I'm sure the Lord didn't feel like dying either. Jesus probably didn't feel like dying for me. The least I could do is walk for him out of obedience or control my flesh or control my anger or put down the fork or, you know, put down the, substance or get some help. <sighs> B, 
being temperate and self-controlled is part of the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Temperance. Those fruits of the Spirit are what is produced when the Spirit is in control. Among them is temperance, which is the Greek word inkrat, I-A. I'm so good at this. Which means self-control, continence, and temperance. What is my point? There's a whole lot of people out in the world right now just yielding to all the lower urges of their flesh and committing all kinds of sin. And if you ask an awful lot of them, they would claim they can't help it. But reality is they've yielded to the devil so long. It's just a habit. It's just a track. It's just a gear they get into without even thinking anymore. The devil, unless you're totally possessed, can't make you do anything. And you only get totally possessed by yielding to him all the time. Yielding yourself on purpose to him. That's the only way. You, you, you know, it's not, it's not possible for you to walk down the street and get a demon. You got to be yielding to stuff and, 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 and obeying the lower urges of your flesh and the, and the shovings of the devil. I can't help it. We can all help it. 1 Corinthians 9 27, the Apostle Paul speaking. He said, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. You know, I made up my mind recently. How stupid would it be for me to die because I wasn't doing right by my body and cut short my ministry and not fulfill the plan of God? That's just dumb. Are you with me? And I thought, you know, how? what possible excuse would I give to the Lord when I stood before him? It's not that the right food wasn't available. It's not that I couldn't even walk in the air conditioning. I would have, do you understand what I'm saying? I, I just grabbed myself by the nap of the neck and said, no more excuses. No more. Sometimes you just got to do that with whatever it is. And trust me, I know the struggle is real. I, I, you know, I used to say all the time, I'm a stress eater, but I quit saying that. I tried, you know, I can't eat when I'm stressed, but that hadn't kicked in yet. <laughs> but I figured, I figured it was a better confession than I'm a stress eater. <laughs> Just being real. <laughs> But how many of you know we all have different struggles in different areas? Different ways we all have to keep our flesh under. But Jesus died and gave us the power and the right to do that. Paul said, I, me, the real man on the inside, I keep my body under. Lest after I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. You can do it. You can keep your body under. You can. Listen, I know this by the Spirit of God. There's somebody in here tonight. God wants to use you in ministry in the most phenomenal way. And the devil has opposed you because he recognizes the anointing on you. And and he has targeted you for temptation, trying to keep you under his thumb because he's afraid of you. Why is the battle so fierce? Because you scare the wadden out of him. I heard somebody say one time, if you knew what was on the other side of that mountain, you'd move it. If you knew what was on the other side of that mountain, you'd move it. (laughs) 
listen, I know by the Spirit of God, the battle's been tough. It's been agonizing at points to the point where you don't even know if you can make it. But I'm here tonight to tell you by the Spirit of God, the reason you're struggling so hard is because of what God has for you to do. But you can't do it in that state. You got to conquer. You got to overcome. Because he wants to use you in the most phenomenal way to change the lives of so many people. It'll be worth it. It'll be worth it when you see. It'll be worth every tear you cried in the battle. It'll be worth every pound of flesh you lost while fighting the fight. If you could only see. If you could only see. The plan of God before you. The word of God says in the last of the last days. Men will side in with the devil. And with their flesh. And be false accusers of the brethren. And incontinent. Lacking self-control. Listen, as long as you're in this body, you're going to struggle with your flesh. I am not, please don't feel condemned if you struggle in your flesh. You know what? All that means is you're going the right way. If you and the, and the devil were headed the same direction, you'd never run into him. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you've had to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him or with your flesh, I, I have nothing but the greatest compassion and the greatest, you know, uh, understanding of the struggle. And I'm not, I'm not making light of the struggle at all. What I'm saying tonight is you can do it. You can do it. Whatever you have to overcome to fulfill the will and the plan of God, you can do it. The reason Satan is fighting you so hard is because he doesn't want you to fulfill your destiny. He doesn't want you to have the life that God has for you. But you can do it. He's provided the way. Through the blood of his son. Father, we come before you right now in Jesus' name. And Father, first of all, I thank you for the precious blood of your son that opened our covenant to us, that does take into account and is accessed only by our heart by believing in our heart that Jesus is the Son of God, by believing that he came to the earth and died upon the cross to pay for our sins, by believing that he was raised from the dead and receiving him as our Savior and making him the Lord of our life, truly the belief of our heart gains access into the covenant regardless of our nationality, regardless of our ethnicity. Father, you are the greatest great equalizer and you have made the way open to all and I thank you for it I thank you that you are a good father who loves your children and you've provided us tools in the new covenant to live victoriously over our flesh and over the temptation of the enemy and Father, help us, help us to see uh, things as they truly are. You know, Father, sometimes when we're in the heat of the battle, when we're in the, in the middle of it, it just seems so big and so overwhelming. But if we'll just take it for the next five minutes, for the next five minutes, I'm going to do right. For the next five minutes, I'm going to be right. 
For the next five minutes, I'm going to control what, my flesh. For the next five minutes, I, I'm going to do what's right in your sight. Then five will turn into ten, which will turn into thirty, which will turn into sixty, which will turn into twenty-four hours, which will turn into uh, a week, which will turn into a month and a year. And we'll live lives that are pleasing to you. And I thank you, Father, for showing us these signs of what, uh, of what is in this the last of the last days. So that we'll know how to conduct ourselves. So that we'll know how to live. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name.